was like an everyday game for 20 years. Before Tiger Woods, there was the one game.
Sponsors of the Fourth Team Series itself are the uh, Vice Chancellor and Provost, uh, Vice Chancellor of Interdisciplinary and Cross Campus Affairs, University Librarian, Dean of Social Studies, Dean of, Depart Dean of uh, Humanities, the Luskin Center for Innovation, and the Department of Political Science. And a special thank you to Merv and Dr. Bonnie Peck for their support of this colloquial series. So, we are um, fortunate to have Sian with us today. Um, she is, in my judgment, part of a, a, a new and growing group of researchers uh, 
in social behavioral and cognitive sciences who are bringing um, a new understanding to what happens at the intersection of social, emotional, and cognitive activity. We, we've known that interactive and intersective for a very long time, but this work that she's going to talk about, at least part of it, is part of a new energy for that discipline. So I'm very excited that she's here to tell us about her work. She um, is a University of California graduate, a BA from uh, UCSD. She got a PhD from Michigan State in uh, Museology and Technology. Uh, the title of her talk is Academic Performance and Stress at the Intersection of Emotion and Cognitive Control. Thank you for coming, Elizabeth. Thank you for coming and um, having me here. It's been very nice to get away from the zero degree weather that we're having in Chicago. So LA in January seems really fun. And um, this is a unique opportunity because I have uh, my family from California. My mom is here somewhere in the audience. So if you have any hard questions, you can ask her. <laughs> um, but I also have one of my, I guess I can say my academic children. Does that, does that work? Uh, Gerardo Ramirez, who is, um, is a postdoc here and will be starting as a faculty member next year in the Department of Psychology and um, School of Education. So, and he actually is the driving force behind a lot of this work. So if you have other hard questions, you can ask Gerardo. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, I have Susan Levine, who's on, on sabbatical here, who's one of my collaborators on this work as well. So I don't have to answer any questions now. <laughs> um, today I'm going to talk to you about some of the work that we've been doing in my lab, really trying to understand how to advance academic achievement. And my really party line in all of this is again, that if we're going to understand how to help students perform at their best, we not only need to consider how material is taught and the content knowledge, what kids know, but we also have to think about their anxieties, their motivations, um, how excited they are to learn. And only by considering these effective factors along with what they know can we really figure out how to advance academic achievement. And I started my research career asking questions about performance and stress, mostly in, in at the athletic world, trying to understand how we um, sometimes miss that three-foot putt when all of our buddies are watching. I know Bob never misses that putt. Um, and I've really become interested in the last several years in understanding why we sometimes feel stress and pressure and why students sometimes don't perform up to their best in the academic world. So today I'm going to focus on the work that we've been doing in academics, and I'll give you a little overview of some of the work going on in my lab, and then I'm going to really focus in on one phenomenon that we've been particularly interested in as of late. So when I talk about academic stressors, I just want to give you an idea of what we're studying. Um, in work in my lab, we do a lot of work looking at high-stakes tests, so the SAT, the GRE, entrance exams. We want to understand why students sometimes fail to perform at their best to show what they know when the stakes are high. Um, we also have been really interested in a phenomenon called stereotype threat, where people might underperform just because they're aware of negative stereotypes about how their social group, their gender group, the stereotype that girls aren't good as math or minorities aren't as intelligent, how these stereotypes might affect how people perform. And finally, we've been interested in another type of stress that people carry about a particular area, specifically math. And we often talk about it as math anxiety. And we've been interested in what it means to have math anxiety, how it relates to students' math performance, their achievement. And our goal is to understand something about what this phenomenon is so that we can actually devise teaching strategies, educational environments to help people perform at their best in math, to help alleviate some of this link between math anxiety and achievement. And that's really what I'm going to focus on today, this notion of math anxiety. Really, what it comes down to is feelings of tension, apprehension, or fear about doing math or math-related tasks. And math anxiety is a really interesting phenomenon, especially in the US, because you don't hear people, at least educated people, walking around oftentimes bragging about the fact that they can't read or they're not a reading person. But you hear people all the time saying, oh, I'm not a math person. Oh, I'm not good with numbers. Whether they don't want to calculate the tip on the dinner bill or they just say this in a classroom environment. Um, and we're really trying to understand what this means. Is it just that people who say they're anxious about it are poor at math? Or is there something about the anxiety itself that essentially robs people of the brain power that they could otherwise use to perform at their best? And that's really been our um, idea here that math anxiety essentially affects the cognitive processes people have 
to use and perform at their best. So I'm going to try and convince you of that today, that math anxiety can have this deleterious effect on what we're able to show, of what we know can affect what kids learn, can, can affect how they perform. And by understanding that, then we're in a position to start thinking about dealing with the effective component of math along with the content itself when we're thinking about devising curricula, training teachers to perform at their best. So we're going to look at math anxiety from a number of different angles. I'm going to show you some work in our laboratory where we actually bring people in who may be lower or higher in math anxious, anxiety and see how they perform on different types of tasks. Um, we're going to, I'm going to show you some work in the classroom about math anxiety, this phenomenon, how it relates to performance even early in learning. And I'm also going to show you some work that we um, do using neuroscientific methods such as functional magnetic resonance imaging where we can actually take a peek inside the heads of people lower and higher in anxiety to see if we can find neural signatures of what it means to be math anxious and to see if that might tell us something about how it relates actually to their math performance. So I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour of what we're doing today. And um, feel free to ask questions, and I'll take questions at the end as well. And so my whole goal by the end of this talk is to convince you that we really need to think about these effective factors of performance in addition to just the content knowledge, the teaching strategies, what we know. Um, so back to math anxiety. People sometimes ask me, how prevalent is math anxiety? And there's been several surveys trying to get at how much math anxiety people, especially in the US, feel. Um, it turns out that in adult college-age samples, over 90% of individuals report having some negative experience with math in schooling. If you look at four-year university students, up to 50% report having moderate to high levels of math anxiety, and this number rises above 80% in community college samples. So lots of people report having negative experiences with math. And many researchers thought, well, this anxiety might come up maybe in middle school or in high school when the curriculum gets more demanding. But in the last several years, we've been looking at and asking questions about whether we can find evidence of math anxiety, maybe even really at the beginning of normal schooling. Yes. Are you differentiating between math anxiety and arithmetic anxiety? Not at this point. So this is just anxiety about numbers or number-related things. Right. And so, especially early on in schooling, it might just be anxiety about anything having to do with numbers. And um, I'll tell you about um, how we actually get at that in a second. So the first work I want to tell you about was actually spearheaded by Gerardo, and we went in actually to ask if young kids at the start of formal schooling, like first and second grade, might e say they even have math anxiety and how that might be related to math achievement. And we initially came to a problem doing this because there was no way to measure math anxiety in young kids. Any of the scales or questionnaires where you asked how anxious someone was were really developed for middle school and beyond. So Gerardo began by actually developing a questionnaire to get at students' math anxiety. We came up with a really neat way to do this. Um, students uh, were sat one-on-one -on -one with an experimenter. We pulled first and second grade students out of class, and they got a little block of smiley faces on them from um, a happy sort of smiling face to a really nervous one. We told them about what this meant, and then they got to slide a little lever to answer how nervous or not nervous certain activities made them feel. So they were asked questions like, how do you feel when you take a big test in your math class? And they could slide the little lever to the, the face that looked really anxious, or the lever where the face wasn't anxious at all, or how do you feel when getting your math book and seeing all the numbers in it? So they got to do this, and we were able to record their responses to how anxious they got when doing these sorts of uh, getting these sorts of situations. And the first question we had was, do students at this young level report being anxious about math at all? So what I'm going to show you now is just a histogram um, of a plotting of how anxious on average students reported feeling to these types of questions. And what you can see is that some of the students reported not being anxious about doing math, but some of them reported being pretty anxious about math and math-related content. So here's a histogram of our 150 students or so responses. The number of kids is on the y-axis, and what you see is a pretty normal distribution. Uh, some of our kids reporting being pretty anxious about doing math. So just because first and second graders are reporting that they have some anxiety about doing math, we have no idea whether this relates actually to their math performance. So in addition to giving them questionnaires about their math anxiety, we also had them take a standardized math achievement test. You had two questions on the previous slide. Yes. What are you showing us here? There are 16 questions, and this is an average um, response to each question. Thanks. Okay, so we have them, um, so this is just their rating of their math anxiety score overall from these 16 questions. Okay, so we also, in a different session, had them take measures of math achievement. So we gave them a standardized measure of math achievement. 
Um, here's just an example. This is from the Woodcock Johnson Applied Problem Subtest. Um, and students answered questions like how many squares are there, or, or um, if you had seven pennies and you spent three, how many pennies would you have left? And this is a nationally normed measure of math achievement. And the question was, does this rating of math anxiety relate to their level of math achievement? So we related how anxious students were to their level of math achievement. And sure enough, what we found was the higher math anxious a student was, the lower their math achievement. But one interesting thing that we found is that this relationship between math anxiety and math achievement wasn't the same for all students. <laughs> Some students actually reported or showed more of a negative relationship between their anxiety and achievement than other students. And to look at these differences, we also captured one other variable related to students, which is essentially something we talk about in cognitive psychology is their working memory. So you can think of working memory at a general level as um, <coughs> your mental scratch pad that allows you to keep information held in consciousness. It allows us to focus in on some things and get rid of other things. And we know that working memory, an individual's level of working memory, relates to their academic achievement. People often talk about it as a building block of IQ, and generally kids who have more working memory perform better at academic tasks. So one question we had was, how does the relationship between math anxiety and math achievement differ for kids who have more working memory, more of a, an ability to perform at the top in a class, versus less working memory, one might say less of an ability to achieve at a high level. And you might think it would be the low working memory kids, those who come to the table with the, less, the least amount of cognitive resources that are really impacted by these high stress situations. After all, they don't have so much working memory at their disposal. And maybe if what anxiety does is create worries or distractions about the task, it might essentially rob them of the resources they have to focus on what they're doing. But there's another possibility, and this comes from some of the work we've done in adults, is that kids who actually are the most prone to achieve at the top would be the ones who would be most affected by math anxiety. And this is because they rely really heavily on this cognitive resource that we know is so important to focus and perform well. And if these kids are robbed of essentially their advantage, they might be most affected by math anxiety. So what we did is we looked at the relationship between math anxiety and math performance as a function of whether kids were lower in working memory or higher <coughs> in working memory. And we assessed working memory with a forward and backwards digit task. Essentially, we'd read kids a number of digits, and they'd have to repeat them back in either the same order or in the reverse order. And this reverse order, I think, really gets this ability to juggle information in your head to manipulate it and to spit it back out. And so what I'm going to show you now is the relationship between math anxiety, kids reported math anxiety, and their math achievement as a function of whether a kid was assessed as being low in working memory or a kid was assessed as being high in working memory, maybe having the highest potential for success. Okay, so what I'm showing you here on the y-axis is just their math achievement. Um, it's a grade equivalent score, so if you're at a one, you're scoring at about the grade one level. And what I've done here is just plotted for you in relative terms kids who reported having lower math anxiety versus kids who reported having higher math anxiety. And I'm showing you now just the lower working memory kids. And what you see is a relatively flat line. Essentially, math anxiety, kids who are higher or lower in math anxiety, if they're low in working memory, if they don't have as much of this cognitive horsepower I talk about it, are not affected any differentially by the math anxiety. But you see a really different pattern of results if you look at the higher working memory kids. So if they're low in math anxiety, they're outperforming their lower working memory counterparts. But if they're higher in math anxiety, they, it's almost as if it looks like they're dropping to the level of the lower working memory counterparts. And essentially what we're showing here is a stronger negative relationship between math anxiety and math achievement for those kids who at the outset might be most predicted to succeed. And we think this is really important because what it's suggesting is that anxiety, in a sense, might be robbing those kids who have the most potential of the cognitive resources that they could otherwise use to perform well. Now this is an interesting finding and we have very similar data in our adult literature when we put people in high stakes testing situations, it's those students with the highest work memory, those adults with the most cognitive horsepower, the most ability to focus on a problem that are most effective. But the question is what's going on here? What's happening with these high working memory kids who are higher in math anxiety? Why aren't they performing like their high working memory counterparts who don't have math anxiety? So Gerardo has been spending a lot of time actually coding the strategies these students use to solve problems on the Woodcock-Johnson <coughs> test to try and get an idea of what high working memory kids who we think normally would have the most cognitive horsepower are doing differently 
when they have a lot of anxiety relative to when they don't. And we're starting to approach this from a number of different ways. We have, still have a ways to go, but I just want to give you a taste of one of the things that we're looking at. We know that different types of problem-solving strategies rely more or less on working memory. You can come up with a pretty simple way to solve a problem like 8 plus 4, say by counting on your fingers. You don't have to hold a lot in your mind. It's a fairly good way to solve a problem, but you tend to make mistakes when you do something like this. It's often characteristic of kids who are less advanced. But we also know that there's problem-solving strategies that are more characteristic of being more advanced that tend to rely on, a lot on working memory. So just as an example here, um, there's two types of strategies you might use to solve this 8 plus 4 equals question mark. Um, and these are just two. One, you could count on your fingers, 9, 10, 11, 12. It doesn't require a lot of working memory, but we know that this is often characteristic of kids who are less advanced and kids tend to make mistakes. Or you could rely on a strategy involving decomposition where you might break down the, the four into smaller units to come up with the answer. This often leads to a correct answer, but it's very working memory standing. And kids who tend to use such a strategy are often gauged as more advanced. So one thing that we've been asking is, among our higher working memory kids, do kids with math anxiety tend to use different strategies than kids without math anxiety? And Gerardo is writing up some really interesting results right now, which suggests the answer is yes. The hot, for the high working memory kids, the more math anxiety they have, the more they're likely to use these rudimentary strategies. And when they use these rudimentary, like finger counting strategies, the worse in math they perform. So now we're starting to identify some of the strategy differences that kids who come to the table with the most cognitive resources might use differentially as a function of whether they're anxious about math versus not. Now we don't know if these anxious kids who are high in working memory switch to the easier strategy when they're taking a test or never learn the harder strategy to begin with, but we do know that we now have a signature of what separates our kids with the most potential <coughs> as a function of how much anxiety they have, and one signature of this is the strategies they tend to use. Kids with a lot of potential, a lot of working memory, who are high in anxiety tend to rely on less sophisticated strategies that are prone to mistakes, and as a result, they perform poorly. And this is interesting to us because it suggests a window into changing how these anxious kids perform by thinking about the strategies we're teaching them and their ability to solve these types of problems. So to us, it seems to suggest that there are specific ways we might go in and think about teaching kids differently as a function of the anxiety they have in terms of the strategies we provide them or the resources we provide them for working with these strategies, whether it's pencil and paper, something to offload working memory, or teaching them multiple strategies. We think this is one window into thinking about how to help these kids with the most potential of performance. Yeah. Anxiety is your self-reporting, right? Yes. Uh, have you ever done study that you can manipulate that? Yes. So we, I have a whole line of work where we actually manipulate how much anxiety people are under at a particular amount of time or how much pressure. And they look very similar, the pattern of results to this side. <coughs> but with first graders, we haven't been courageous enough to go in and manipulate how much pressure they feel at a particular point in time. I'm not sure we're ever going to get in to do that. Um, that might be something for you to do. <laughs> but we're mostly interested right now in the anxieties they come to the table with. And that's a great segue into the next part of my talk, because one thing you might be asking yourself is, OK, first and second graders have math anxiety. Where do these negative thoughts about math actually come from? And we've been really interested in this question. And we refer back to this idea that over 90% of college-age students report having some negative experience with math in school. And we thought that perhaps one of the places where these negative thoughts about math might come from are the classroom. And another reason that we thought this was the case is because if you ask parents whose responsibility it is to teach reading and math, oftentimes parents think that their responsibility is to deal with reading at home, and kids get lots of reading input at home. They have bedtime stories, right? Um, you, re you rarely see bedtime math, although Susan and I are, are, are tackling that right now. Um, but parents really feel, at least in the US, that there's a responsibility for reading at home. But the math is often thought about as a responsibility of the teacher. Right? So we thought that maybe some of the anxieties and the fe negative feelings about math these students might have could possibly originate in the classroom. So in another set of studies, we went to actually tackle this issue to look at how possibly the anxieties of the teachers in the classrooms might relate to how the students would feel. And this was really prompted by some interesting research that had asked questions about how much <coughs> levels of anxiety different college majors feel or report. So if I asked you to guess what college major has the highest level of math anxiety, what would you say? Pre-med. 
pre-med, okay, any other guests here? It always depends on who I'm talking to. If I'm talking to psychologists, they definitely say it's psychology. Very quickly, they come up with that. Yeah. English, okay. Math. Economics. Math, right? So a number of studies have asked questions about how much math anxiety people feel as a function of their college major, and it's usually um, a fairly simple self-report scale for the adults don't get to do the funny, slidey um, scale with the faces. It's not as exciting. They usually get questions like this. How anxious would the following make you feel? Like reading a cash register receipt, when you buy something, studying for a math test, receiving a math textbook. They ask a number of questions, usually on a 12 to 24 point scale, or 24 question scale, although there's now research showing that you can just ask people one question about their math anxiety, and it correlates very highly with this, um, the, the long list of questions. So people are, um, I think, pretty willing to talk about their math anxiety, and it seems to be fairly easy to gauge um, how much anxiety people have. And what um, one, several groups of researchers have done has have done meta-analyses across these different studies of different majors asking about math anxiety. And what I'm going to show you now is just a general plot of math anxiety as a function of different college majors. And the major with the highest level of math anxiety is um, elementary education. Yeah. So you can oh, yeah. see math anxiety is here on, on the y axis going up. And what you can see is just, it's just a rough schematic of different college majors. And one thing people have reliably found is that people who are majoring in education, especially early education, tend to have high levels of math anxiety. So we thought perhaps students might be getting some of this anxiety about doing math from their teachers, especially if they are anxious about their own math ability in the classroom. So we set out to do a study where we actually measured kids' math achievement at the beginning and the end of the school year, and we measured the math anxiety and also the math content teaching knowledge of the teachers. So we tried to get a measure of the math teacher's knowledge, but also their anxiety. And then we asked how this anxiety related to kids' achievement at both the beginning and the end of the year. And not surprisingly, we found that teachers' math anxiety had no relation to their kids' math achievement at the beginning of the year, and this is what you'd expect. It's sort of a control for our study. If kids are randomly assigned to classrooms, their teacher's level of anxiety shouldn't relate to the kids' math achievement. But we found a very different pattern of results at the end of the year. And one other thing I forgot to tell you about these elementary education majors who go on to be elementary school teachers is that they are a very homogeneous sample in one other thing. Does anyone know what that might be? Gender. So overnight, Jim, you already know the answer to this. <laughs> I'm like planting you in the audience. So over 95% of for elementary school teachers, especially early elementary school, are women. So what this suggests is that we might be putting anxious female teachers in the classroom teaching content that could maybe, possibly their anxiety might run off, rub off on their students. And so what I showed you before is at the beginning of the year, there was no relationship, or what I told you before, there was no relationship between the teachers math anxiety and her students' math achievement. But at the end of the year, what we found is that a higher, the higher the teacher's math anxiety, the lower the math achievement of the girls in her classroom. It wasn't there for the boys. There was a hint of it, but it really was the higher the, the female teacher's math anxiety, the lower the girls' math achievement. And we wondered, well, what could maybe account for this? Could it be that the girls are picking up on something from their teachers that might relate to how they felt and their confidence about doing math. So we also gave girls at both the beginning, and boys at both the beginning and the end of the year, questions that tried to get at how confident or how good they felt about their own ability to do math. And the way that we did this was we asked them questions. We told them a story, actually, about a kid who was good at reading and a kid who was good at math. And we asked them to draw the kid. And what we were really interested in is whether girls, for example, might be more likely to draw boys at being good at math when they're in a classroom with teachers who are female and anxious about their own math ability, especially at the end of the year. And here's just an example of one of the drawings we got from one of the girls in our study. Um, we told them a story about a kid who was good at reading and a kid who was good at math. They obviously drew a girl over here, but we always asked them at the end what the gender was. This egg over here was actually said to be a boy, so it's an example of endorsing this sort of stereotype. And what we found was, when we went and looked at this relationship between the teacher's math anxiety and her student's math achievement and her girl's math achievement, that the higher the teacher's math anxiety, the more likely the girls were by the end of the year to endorse the stereotype that girls are good at reading and boys are good at math. And the more likely they were to endorse the stereotype, the worse they were performing in math. So we have this relationship now from a female teacher's math anxiety to the girls endorsing of these gender stereotypes to the girl's math achievement. Now, 
this was really an interesting finding and we thought made a lot of sense, but I wanted to point out, and we really weren't satisfied that we had all the answers because this was a pretty small study. We had 17 teachers and we had 154 students, so it was a very small sample. So over the last several years, we've set out to really take a much broader look at this relationship because we think it's a really important phenomenon. And we're just finishing analyzing the data. We now have 78 teachers and over 700 of their students and we've now asked the same questions about the relationship between teacher's math anxiety and her student's math achievement at the end of the school year and what might account or mediate this. And I can tell you, um, we, were, we were gratified, maybe not excited, this is not the sort of phenomenon you're really excited about, but we were gratified to see that we found the same relationship with our larger sample. So what I'm just uh, plotting you here on the y-axis is just the grade change across the school year as a function of taking this standardized math test so you might expect to change about a grade across the school year, and we didn't get at the very beginning and end of the school year, so they haven't changed so much. And what I've done here just for illustrative purposes is plot the grade change of girls in the low math anxious teachers classrooms versus high math anxious teachers classrooms. And what you can see is that the girls in the low math anxious teacher classrooms are growing more in their math knowledge across the school year than the girls in the high math anxious teacher classrooms. How do you measure teachers? Myself. We and use that, that, that's the example of the question um, that I showed you before, so like how anxious would you get when you read a self-report. Yes, a self-report. But we do also have measures of um, state anxiety before and after they take a, took a math test, and actually have measures of cortisol before the, and after they took a math test, and cortisol is a, <coughs> is a stress hormone that's released in these But you measure it, but how is that anxiety displayed in the classroom, the kids get? That is a great question. <laughs> So, I just had a two hour meeting this morning with Gerardo and Susan and Jim and Karen and work. We now have videos. This big study not only involved measuring teachers' math anxiety and the students' math achievement at the beginning and the end of the school year, but we actually videotaped the math lessons of 30 teachers who vary in their math anxiety. We videotaped three, about three math lessons for each teacher and also three equivalent reading lessons. And right now we're just figuring out how to tackle the coding of this video to figure out what behaviors, teachers lower and higher in math anxiety might be displaying in the classroom, that might give off some of this to the kids. We do know it's not just about their math teaching ability, at least as gauged by a pretty intensive um, test that gets at their math knowledge. So we think there's probably something over and above just what they know, maybe how they communicate information. There could be lots of things going on um, that might relate to how differences in the gains of students lower in lower um, anxiety teachers versus higher math anxiety teacher classrooms across the school year. Just as a pilot, we've done some work um, which builds on some of the earlier work by Jim and colleagues, um, just with a very few teachers who are high in math anxiety, showing that high math anxious teachers um, tended to be more dogmatic in how they taught something. There was one right and wrong way to do this, and they didn't entertain negative answers in the same way. This was like just with a couple teachers that were waiting <coughs> off the ground, but this aligns with some of the work that Jim and others have done showing differences in high-performing um, Asian cultures in math relative to the U.S. in terms of how math is taught. So we think we have this huge, rich data set that we're now just starting to code in terms of understanding what the teachers are doing in the classroom to affect the achievement and, and the thoughts of these kids across the school year. That was a long answer to your question. Yes. Uh, do you have any um, understanding of the uh, anxiety of the teacher versus the ability yeah, so we always have a measure of, um, it's Deborah Ball's math knowledge for teaching, mm -hmm. and so that gives you a measure, measure of content knowledge for teaching math, and we always use it as a covariate. There is a relationship between math anxiety and math ability for teaching, as you might expect. Um, the, our, the, the correlation is about 0.3, maybe a little higher, so it's not everything, but we, we think this is really anxiety over and above their knowledge. But of course, that anxiety could play out in many ways in terms of how they deliver material and how it's taught in the classroom, whether they entertain questions, um, how they think about kids who are struggling, and so we really think that these videos are going to be a really rich source to understand what exactly teachers are doing in the classroom. Yeah. Significant level of the difference? Um, so this it's about a fifth of a grade point across the, the school year, and it's statistically significant. I don't know what value you want me to give you here. Did you find the value? Yes. Well, in terms of a p-value, it, yes. um, it's less than 0.01 in terms of the difference. But I mean, in terms of effect size, so these are small effects. It's um, when you look at the correlation between teacher math anxiety and student math achievement, the correlation is at B 
between 0.2 and 0.3. It's not, they're not huge effects. And I mean, obviously it's a not fifth, fifth of a, grade point. a fifth of a change in a grade point across the fifth school year. A change of a grade point. Yeah. So they're growing about a fifth less, which is, uh, you know, if you think about it in real world terms, I think that's a pretty marked difference. Right? I mean, if you're I'm achieving a sure, fifth less. That's for the discussion. Right. That could be for the discussion. It seems to me if you've got a kid growing a whole grade and you've only got yeah. one kid growing four fifths. Well, because of their the entire school yeah. talking about one Right. Year. This is yeah, one yeah, year. This, this is for discussion. We can talk about the discussion. Okay. So now I've shown you that we replicate our effect in girls, but we found something interesting. We Now, with a much larger sample, we also have a very similar effect. So this was a little bit of a puzzle to us, but what we're actually showing is that the teacher's math anxiety is not only affecting the girls' growth across the school year, but the boys' as well. The boys are more variable, um, but it still is having some of the same effect. So the question is, what's going on? I showed you this mediator in our other sample where girls started endorsing the stereotype that boys were better at math, and this explains some of their achievement. Well, what's going on here with the boys? We actually looked at a very same metric for the boys, and what we showed is that when kids are in classrooms with teachers who are math anxious, they start endorsing their own gender as being better at math less. So the girls start endorsing that boys are better at math, and the boys actually start endorsing that girls are better at math, or at least relatively. <coughs> boys tend to think that they're good at everything, right? Across the school year, boys are much more likely to say they're good at reading and math, and girls are likely to say that they're good at reading and math, but that's another discussion. But when boys are in classrooms with high math anxious teachers, by the end of the school year, they start saying their gender is not as good at math, and they grow less in their math game as a result. So there's something we think about, maybe gender is a highly salient feature, and boys in classrooms with math anxious teachers are just less confident in their ability in general to do math, and they extrapolate that to their gender group. We don't know, we don't have all the answers to these questions yet, but we do know that being in these highly math anxious teacher classrooms seems to affect both the boys and the girls in terms of their growth and math achievement. The boys a little bit less, but it still seems to be there in our big sample. And it seems to affect how confident these kids are in their ability to do math. And that might be assessed by how well they think someone like them could do math. And at this young age, girls think that people like them are girls, boys think that people like them are boys, and they tend to think that people like them are less able to do math, and this leads to less of a growth in math achievement. So again, we're getting some measure that this teacher's math anxiety seems to be affecting the kid's math achievement, and this essentially can be translated at least somewhat into children's confidence about their ability to do math. Yes? That's not true, that statement that you just made, because although what you've done is you've taken people a measure of elementary school teachers that may have had a display of math anxiety. There's no indication that there's math anxiety that's going on when they're teaching math. That's true. So we don't know that there's math anxiety when <clears throat> teaching math, although we do know that their self-reports of math anxiety reliably predict how much math these kids learn at the end of the school year. Not at the beginning, but the end. So we think that there's some translation from teacher to student. We have no idea what that translation is. But we know that the teacher's report of math anxiety reliably predicts how much a kid in her classroom will achieve at the end of the year. And these tapes now will help us get at what exactly that teacher is doing in the classroom. And you're right, it could be nothing to do with an display, display of anxiety where they say, oh, I'm so nervous about doing this. It could be everything with how they interact with the student, whether they let a student struggle on. We were talking this morning about how maybe high math anxious teachers don't want to see their students struggle in math, because that's it's a negative experience for them. We know that we, when we don't like something, we don't like to see other people in a similar situation, so they cut them off, they don't let them explore, they give them the answer, or they say things like, it's okay, this is really hard for everyone. Maybe they think they're doing something that's helpful and that's not, or maybe they teach differently. So all of these things we're gonna get at, but we don't think it's just that the high math thinks it's teachers know less about math, at least using our measure of math knowledge, because we use that as a covariate, we account for that relationship. So the videos are a really important part of this and a really rich data set. And now we can try and explain why we get a relationship between teachers' self-reports of math anxiety and what their kids are achieving at the end of the year. Last question. Oh. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not sure the videos will reveal quite a lot. Maybe you can show have say a that. condition. <laughs> maybe you should have a condition, for example, parallel to whatever you have here. And uh, maybe the teacher you know, emphasized math. And you know, not easy to go to school. The parents will be overjoyed to hear that teachers are emphasizing math. So you're emphasizing math, is that the same as you know the teacher felt there's anxiety 
<coughs> the part in a way. So somehow you have another condition to show maybe it's not the emphasis, or it's not a teacher you know, maybe it's pronounced several times really, really, really well, discussion. then you know how is that. That's what I'm thinking. I don't know you have it done. All right, it's a great point. And we actually, I think we'll be able to get at that somewhat because we have measures of teachers reading um, lessons as well. So we can look at what they're doing in math class and also what they're doing in reading to see if we see differences in how they're teaching math versus reading content. But we can talk about this in the discussion. Just one more okay. question. Did, did the children, did you have any study that found out uh, whether the students had anxiety for reading also? Yeah, so we have comparable measures for reading anxiety and we show, this is a good point to make, we show that math anxiety predicts math performance. And reading anxiety predicts reading performance. So it's not just that this is general anxiety, but we can find some specific anxieties that predict that specific domain. Right? And so this is really interesting to us because we've always thought that being math anxious doesn't mean that you have low intelligence or low knowledge in general, but it's specifically linked to how you perform in math. And I'm going to show you a little more data that suggests that even more. So I've told you a lot now about the origins of math anxiety, where it might come from, how it manifests early in schooling, but I don't think I've really convinced you, or I haven't convinced myself yet, about this relationship between math anxiety and math achievement. There's this relationship, but what is the relationship? And for many years, lots of people argued that, well, people are math anxious if they're bad at math. It's just a proxy for being bad at math. You, when, you do, when you're bad at something, you're anxious about it. But the way I've been talking about math anxiety is that it really alters our ability to show what we know or to put our full attention forward so that we can learn and perform at our best. And so we in the laboratory have been really interested in trying to tease apart really what math anxiety is in relationship to math achievement. And this is hard to get at in a real world context because you just have correlations, but in the laboratory you can actually manipulate anxiety or you can look at how math anxiety relates specifically to different types of math achievement. And one way that we've done this is to turn to neuroimaging as a tool to try and understand how the brains of math anxious individuals might look different, not just when they're doing math, but even just anticipating doing math. And the idea is that if math anxiety really is about some sort of negative emotional reaction, some anxiety worries that affect how people perform, then we might be able to see evidence of differences in how low versus high math anxious individuals are reacting just to the prospect of doing math, which might tell us something about how they're able to call upon their knowledge during the math situation itself. And it's really hard to get at that as a te on a test <coughs> if you're just getting a behavioral measure because everything is a black box. But with neuroimaging, we can actually look at the neural response to being cued that you're about to do a math test compared to the neural response to being cued that you're going to do, say, a comparable reading task and ask how it relates to actually what happens in the brain when people are doing the task itself. So this doesn't provide all the cues, but it's another piece of converging evidence to get at what it really means to be math anxious and why it negatively relates to math achievement. So it's really this anxiety versus ability question. I'm going to give you one piece of evidence now we think that <coughs> argues for this idea that math anxiety and the negative anticipation of math essentially robs people of the working memory of this cognitive horsepower that they could otherwise use to focus on the math task. And this is one of the reasons why people perform poorly in math. And the way that we got, we did this is we invited people who were lower or higher in math anxiety is based on this self-report questionnaire. These were um, students between the ages of 18 and 35 to come take part in a neuroimaging experiment. They got to get their brain scanned, see a picture of it. We didn't tell them this was about math because we know that people high in math anxiety tend to stay away from math, so we didn't want to advertise it was about math. And when they got to the scanner, we said, surprise, you're going to be lying in this hollow tube. We're going to be looking at your brains while you do some math tasks and also when you do some other tasks as well. Um, no one ran away screaming. They all participated in our study. And um, the, what essentially we did is we designed a paradigm where we could look at the neural activity when they were doing a math task or a comparable reading-based control, which I'll show you in a minute, but also where we could look at the neural activity when we just cued them that they were about to do a math or a word task. So here's essentially what they did. Um, people would get a cue. A yellow cue meant that you were about to do a series of math problems, such as the one on the left here. So you have to decide whether or not this problem is true or false. Does 4 times 8 minus 15 equals 19? Anyone? False. false, right? You press one button with your um, th with thumb, one thumb if it was false, one if it was true. And you also saw a different cue when you were going to do a series of word problems. And essentially the, the goal of this task, it was sort of an anagram task, you had to decide whether, if these letters were in reverse order, whether they'd spell a real English word. Right, so this gets close to spelling the word experiment, but not completely. 
Um, so we spent a lot of time finding tasks that we could match on difficulty where the reaction time and accuracy to doing the math and the word task would be roughly the same. And then we could ask questions about how the word task differs from the math task in terms of neural activation, just for example, in terms of the cue that someone was going to do uh, math versus word task. Yeah. They um, told, were told to go as fast and accurate as possible. It did because of how we acquire the neural activity. It did time out at a certain amount of time. But um, we, we made it so that people could essentially get through the tasks. But we have measures of both reaction time and accuracy in these sorts of tasks. So now I just want to show you um, the behavioral data, how people lower versus higher in math anxiety performed on the math task relative to the word task. And one thing that I've been arguing all along is that this anxiety about math <laughs> essentially has an effect on people's ability to juggle numbers in their head. And so if this is the case and it's not about some measure of general intelligence, we should see that the low and math and high anxious people do the same on the word task, but they really show differences in performance on the math task. And what I'm going to show you now are just error rates. The reaction times look very similar, but I'm going to show you error rates, so higher is worse performance. And this is just error rates um, in response to doing the math versus the, the letter task. Okay? And um, this is work done with one of my former graduate students, Ian Lyons, who um, is going to be on the job market soon. If anyone's looking to hire an awesome cognitive developmental neuroscientist. Um, and essentially, proportion incorrect is on the <coughs> y-axis, so higher is worse. And on the right, we have the low math anxious individuals. And what you can see is that they perform about the same in terms of error rates on the math versus the word task. But the high math anxious individuals show a very different pattern of results. They look just like the low math anxious individuals for the word task terms of their error rates, but for the math test, they have significantly more errors, right? So we have a signature of people who report being math anxious and, and now show performance differences on a math test, but not a comparable difficulty match word test. So now the question is, and what I just want to show you about briefly in this test, is really what happens in the brain for people who are lower versus higher in anxiety when they're just anticipating doing the math versus the word test. So the cues were 100% predictive. And we jittered, essentially, the presentation of the cue and the math versus the word problem. So we could tease out neural activity to the cue. It's always math relative to the word task, and also neural activity to the task. And what I'm going to show you today is just a signature of what it looks like for the high math anxious individuals when they're just, when they know they're going to get a math task, when they are cued with this yellow square relative to the blue one. And so what we did is we regressed math anxiety, this, this measure, this self-report measure of math anxiety, across neural activity at the whole brain level, across the whole brain, looking for regions that look different as a function of the math cue relative to the word cue, and as a function of how math anxious someone was. And what we showed were actually only three or four regions that showed more activity for the math cue relative to the word cue as a function of people's math anxiety. And, question. Yes. Do you see any differences between right and left hemisphere? I'll show you both hemispheres now. Now, all our people were right hand. All of our participants were right handed. So um, we but controlled for that. Left hemisphere as opposed to right hemisphere In with regard to the emotional controls. So let me show you the data, and I'll show you. We actually get bilateral activation in the posterior insula, which goes across both hemispheres. And we actually showed very similar patterns, often, but you can see that the, the patterns here. So what I'm showing you here um, are, is activity in both side hemispheres of the, in the posterior insula and also activity in the mid-cingulate cortex. This was left lateralized. And um, what we see is um, more activity in these areas for the cue that people are going to do math relative to word, the more anxious, math anxious someone was. <coughs> and these areas are interesting because they're often talked about the insula and the mid as being part of our neural pain metrics. These are areas that are activated when we're socially rejected or when we actually feel physical pain. And what we're showing here is that the more math anxious someone is, the more likely they're sh to show activation in neural areas that have been implicated in in feelings of visceral threat and pain detection when they're cued that they're going to do math relative to a word task. Now, they haven't, they're, this is not activation when they're doing the task. This is just anticipation of the task. We're showing that math anxious individuals are showing more activation in these areas we know are involved in pain perception and threat detection. And in other work, we've shown that this activation and anticipation of doing the task actually has downstream consequences and effects 
the working memory, and the cognitive control that individuals are able to bring to do the math task. So we think this starts to paint a picture of the anxiety itself having an effect on the knowledge, the skill, and the attentional control that these high math anxious individuals are able to bring to the math task. And knowing this, we think, is really important because it suggests to us some ways that we might be able to deal with math anxiety. <coughs> so I talked to you at the beginning of the talk about how the teachers might have some effect on the students in terms of their um, math achievement. And what we've started to understand is that we might be able to um, essentially target the teacher's math anxiety itself as a way to enhance math achievement. We know that the strategies really matter in terms of the student's ability to to bring to the table, especially if they're high in working memory and high in math anxiety. And we also now have some evidence that the anxiety itself in this anticipation of doing math might possibly have some effect on what people are able to show in a stressful situation. And building upon this neuro evidence and these last ideas, um, really Gerard has been the driving um, force in this work, we've, designed, we've, decided, we've started to build some paradigms, some interventions to try and get at this anxiety component, to try and alleviate some of the anxiety individuals high in math anxiety might feel before they take a math test. And the idea is that if we can alleviate some of the anxiety itself, we might essentially free up their ability to hone all of their focus, all of their cognitive horsepower to perform at the best on this test. And to do that, we've turned to a paradigm that individuals in the clinical psychology literature have been really interested in as a way to deal with rumination that often accompanies depression. And this is something simple, but it's talked about as just expressive writing, getting out your thoughts and feelings about a negative and stressful event. And there's been a lot of work on this expressive writing technique, and it's been shown that it reduces the load on working memory, on our ability to focus. It helps alleviate some of that burden. It leads people to worry less. And we thought, well, maybe if what part of this math anxiety is doing is creating these worries, these distractions, this negative anticipation that's essentially robbing people of the resources that they could otherwise use to perform well on a test. If we had them engage in this expressive writing exercise where it's almost as if they download some of their worries from mind before they took, say, a math test, then we might be able to essentially reduce the gap between high math anxious individuals and low math anxious individuals in terms of their math performance. So we set out to test this. We brought low and high math anxious individuals into our lab. We told them they were about to take a difficult math and, um, test. And for some of them, we randomly assigned them to do expressive writing before they took the math test. And others, we asked them to, um, in one situation, think about what might be on the upcoming test or just think and sit quietly. Oftentimes, that's what happens before you take a test anyway. So here's essentially what they got. They got instructions that said, in the next seven minutes, write as openly as possible about your thoughts and feelings regarding the math problems you're about to perform. In your writing, I want you to really let yourself go, explore your emotions and thoughts as you're getting ready to start this set of math problems. You might relate your current thoughts to the way you felt during a similar situation at school or in the past. Please try and be as open as possible as you write. The experimenter handed them an envelope with these instructions in it. They wrote for about seven minutes while the experimenter left the room. Then they came back and took the math test. So we now have people who are lower in math anxiety and higher in math anxiety who are about to take a difficult math test. They did some practice so they know what's coming. And we had some of them write and some of them who didn't. And if our data is correct and our interpretation of that data is correct, that some of what this anxiety is, is really it's not just about being bad at math, but it's the anxiety in itself that alters people's ability to show what they know, then we might see that the expressive writing as a way to alleviate these negative thoughts and ruminations, this negative anticipation of this possibly psychologically plain painful experience, we might see that it helps reduce the gap we see between high and low math anxious individuals on a math test. And that's exactly what we found. So what I'm plotting for you here is both reaction time and accuracy to a series of math problems. Again, <coughs> accuracy is in error rates, so higher performance on all of these graphs mean worse, um, higher on all of these graphs mean worse performance. And at the top is problem solving time. At the bottom are our error rates. On the left, we have our control participants who are lower and higher in math anxiety. And on the right, we have participants who took part in our expressive writing paradigm. And what you can see is both for reaction time and error rates for these math problems, doing the expressive writing reduced this performance gap we see between lower and higher math anxious individuals. Um, it reduced it in terms of reaction time and also in terms of error rates. It's, there's still some difference between our low and high math anxious individuals. High math anxious individuals tend to know less math. They stay away from it. They learn less in the class that they take. But part of 
what we think is going on in these anxiety-provoking situations is that the anxiety itself is robbing people of the resources they would otherwise have to perform well. And so getting rid of that, those, that anxiety and the worries provoked by it might help reduce some of this gap. And this is exactly what we find. I should mention we also had another, um, in, as part of this, people took, did a word task as well, so not just math, but we don't see the same effects on the word task. Everyone performs similarly regardless of their math anxiety. We've also tried this expressive writing technique out, not just with math anxiety, but with test anxiety in general. So a student's propensity to worry when they take an important test and we've shown very similar results. Um, but before I get to that, you might wonder what people actually write about when they do this sort of task. Um, so here's just an example of one student's writing. This is a math anxious student's writing. Um, this person wrote, this is the first time I've done an experiment. I don't know what to expect on the math test. I don't like to feel rest or feel pressure. I wish I had a calculator. I hope the problems aren't very difficult. I feel a little anxious about what might be on this test. I also hope the experimenter doesn't watch, because I don't want them to watch while I take this test. I feel even like more pressure. Um, I don't really enjoy math, and if this test is too long, my brain will be fried. I'm not really looking forward to answering math problems for the next hour. I'll be relieved when this is over, and I've earned $10. They got $10. <laughs> so we also analyzed the content of students' writing, and we showed that people who reported expressing more negative ideas, anxiety, and worry thoughts, but also gained insight, some insight into what they were doing. Maybe this wasn't such a big deal, or they reframed the situation. They realized it wasn't such a big uh, deal in, in the long run. They benefited the most from the writing. How old were the author of this event? Uh, college student. Oh, Yes, so this is the college student. Not the first grader. <laughs> we have very advanced first graders in Chicago. <laughs> Um, and so the writing itself does matter. And as I mentioned, we've done this not just with math anxiety, but with just test anxiety, the, the worries that students feel when they're about to take a test. And we didn't do this with, we tried this with high school students. Um, so as for part of Gerardo's, um, I guess this was part of your master's thesis, right? Gerardo went into high school classrooms. Six weeks before high school freshmen took the first final exam of their high school career, he um, took measures of test anxiety, so ge in general, how much um, people profess to be anxious about taking tests. And then, right before their final exam, he randomly assigned some students to an expressive writing condition, very similar to the one I showed you in the laboratory, and some students to a control condition where they just thought <coughs> about what might be on the upcoming exam. And um, he did this two years in a row at a local high school, and we were able to obtain these students' grades for the fall, winter, and spring quarter, um, and then for their final exam, right after this intervention. And we were able to look at that as a function of whether they wrote or not, and whether they were lower or higher in test anxiety. And we found something very similar. Um, so for students who are lower in test anxiety, this is on the right side here, um, there was no difference in their performance on the final exam as a function of whether they took part in our intervention, whether they did the expressive writing or not. Um, but for the students who were higher in test anxiety, there was a big difference. So on the y-axis here is accuracy, so percent correct, so higher is better. And what we showed is that before our intervention, as you might expect, their fall, winter, and spring grades um, were pretty much the same, but we were able to raise students' final exams by about six percentage points as a function of whether they did this writing intervention to the extent that they were higher in test anxiety. And so in reality, that's like going from a B minus to a B plus, which you could imagine is a pretty significant change for a student. And this was just as a function of our writing intervention. We're not teaching content here. We're not changing anything. But the idea is that we're alleviating some of the burden students might feel in the testing situation as a function of their professed anxiety about taking a test or as a function of their anxiety about math. Okay. So just to sum up, sum up here, um, I hope I've convinced you some today that math anxiety starts early. Um, it can be transferred from teacher to student, and it's not just a proxy for poor math skills. We think that the anxiety in itself can affect students' ability to perform at their tests and uh, at their best. And really what I'm showing you and what I've been arguing is that academic success is much more than what you know. Our anxieties, our attitudes are critical, and if we don't take that into account, we're not doing all we can to promote academic achievement and to help students perform at their best um, in school and I think beyond as well. So I'm happy to take questions, and uh, I'll end there. And if you want to read more about this, you can check out my book, called Chuck So we have a bunch of time for what I anticipate will be a lively discussion. <laughs> I was very much impressed by your lecture and the research you've done, but I'm dismayed that there's one little word that's 
seems to be missing from the whole thing. Fun. Uh, if I may give my own experience, from the ages of 10 to 14, I was, there was a war on in England, and consequently anybody who could do any math was involved in the war effort. And so I was taught by a, a sort of series of uh, octogenarian crops and uh, neurotics. And uh, the whole the math seemed to be a terrible chore. When I changed school at the age of 14, I wanted to do science, but I was told, no way, because your math skills are absolutely awful. And uh, one, uh, one day, I was talking to uh, another kid who uh, was doing that, and he explained calculus to me. Ah, gosh, this was absolutely wonderful. You know, this was a real fun thing. I, and, you know, I really regretted that I was in the wrong stream by this time. And it seems to me that uh, it's not so much a matter, matter of whether the teacher is anxious or not. It's a matter of whether the teacher is saying, hey, you can have real fun doing this. This is, this is uh, you know, like answering riddles and things like that. I think that's a great insight. And can I would argue that... The question? Oh, so the idea was that um, it's not as much about math anxiety, possibly, as the idea that explaining math is something that could be fun rather than a chore, right? Because oftentimes math is seen as this chore, and we walk around saying, oh, I'm not a number person. Oh, I can't deal with my checkbook. Oh, you calculate the tip. Um, and I think, you know, it's a really interesting insight, and I would argue that there's probably a relationship between how much anxiety you feel and how you look at that situation, whether it's something that you want to confront or something you want to run away from. So it'll be interesting, actually, to see what the teachers are doing in the classroom in terms of how they're talking about math, whether it's, oh, we have to do math now, or, oh, we get to do math. I mean, something simple like that might actually affect the kids' achievement. So I think this is a great insight. That just relates to something I thought about when you showed the slide and the other faces, there was no smiley face. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, if a kid likes math, where's my smiley face? Yeah, that's a new, really interesting question. Uh, maybe I should um, have Gerardo answer that, because we grappled with how to do those skills a lot. But I might, you might, you go ahead. Why don't you take that? Well, in a follow-up study, which you did in a, we actually had five uh, faces, and one of those faces was actually a smiley face. Yeah, right. So the option yeah. was there in a follow-up study, we found the exact same. We originally didn't do it because people often have debates about whether the positive to negativity of anxiety versus this enjoyment are on different constructs in general. So we were hesitant to put them all on the same scale, but we have done that in a follow-up, and it's very similar. Some kids do think it's fun, but lots of kids don't. <laughs> I get them the JC when they really can't have two plus two. My question is, do you know of anything else besides the writing, which I'm going to try in a couple weeks, how about something like deep breathing or meditation or some relaxation kind of exercise? Is there anything else that you know of besides the right? Yeah, so actually, in CHOKE, I talk a lot about different techniques and the research behind them that people have used to deal with anxiety and performance situations. So I will, in, in my book, I give the science, what we know, and there's still a lot to do. You know, We're just exploring this writing methodology. There's lots of unanswered questions. But I give the science and then some techniques, and you can decide for yourself what you think it's good to do, but there's lots of work lately in cognitive neuroscience about the power of meditation and how it can help in terms of allowing us to control our focus of attention. I mean, when you think about it, lots of meditative practices, what they are in essence is training people to not sort of be taken over by distractions and extraneous thoughts, and so to let some of that go, which may the writing may, may help achieve as well. well this very school, uh exploits uh, math anxiety to, uh, uh, as the gatekeeper to the sciences, where they run students through the freshman eliminators to weed out those who can't cut it, or the Marines, or whatever. So uh, in practice, the, the effect you found is well known forever. Okay. <laughs> Except they didn't teach math in elementary school when I was a kid. We had a arithmetic, but we never had math. Now, it, although they can work by Kesner, it was already well known. Uh, and we knew that kids could do math, uh, but uh, they didn't teach math in elementary school. And, uh, we, you know, plenty of arithmetic. We could do get out of the eighth grade and do square roots and stuff like that, but we didn't know any math. I think that's a 
sense of, there's still lots of talk about this today with, for example, fractions being an issue that lots of students struggle with, and we're showing this can, we're seeing some evidence that this can be especially the case um, in different situations like community college situations. But back to your point about using it as a gatekeeper, I think you know some of what my research shows, especially with this idea that these anxieties can have the most impact on those students who might otherwise be most capable, is that using this as like a weeding strategy, we might be missing a subset of psychologically very capable students in other situations that could go on and succeed. And if the anxiety is deterring them early on or, get, or making it so they don't go on, we might be missing people who we could be tapped to go on and be very successful in these areas. And if that ends up being for a subset of individuals, whether it's girls in math or a particular subset of individuals, we could be really doing a disservice to who we're allowing through to potentially gain the knowledge to succeed in the end. And a disservice to society. I mean, certainly we're not preparing enough mathematically competent individuals in our society, so you could argue that that's as in general, but yeah. I consistently got very high scores on aptitude tests like the SAT and GMAT, but I, I couldn't handle the math here. Um, I have a wife who is particularly good at me, and uh, among other subjects, who did very poorly when it came to exam time. She didn't fail, but she couldn't get distinctions when they were put in for them. So the anticipation throughout her schooling was that she was going to do very well. But she didn't cover that at all, the high achievers who don't achieve because of the stress levels. And just one other point, talking about uh, the SAT scores. Um, in 2002, more than a million children were examined from, I think, 7th grade to 11th grade in California measuring their levels of fitness to their math and reading scores. They're very highly correlated. Mm -hmm. So what does it have to do with self-image, physical fitness, the ability to work accurately because the body's working accurately? Oh, their levels of physical fitness. Is that yeah. what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of work that's showing that people's um, physical experience from babies onward has implications for our cognitive achievement, right, and beyond. So I think there's there's lots of correlations across all these areas. But just because they're correlated doesn't mean there there also aren't particular anxieties you could have about a particular subject that could affect that subject and not necessarily your success in other avenues of life. And so we've been particularly interested in, in math anxiety, but certainly anxieties in general about taking a test or your general ability to acquire information affects across all domains. Is that in your chat book? I do talk about that in the book. <laughs> but. So the expressive writing results are really impressive, and there's other ones too, of course, yes. other domains. Yes. But um, oh, the that idea that in more detail, the mechanism, I mean, that some just smart person looking at that manipulation might just as well argue that you're going to amplify writing them out would amplify those. No, I think that's anxiety. I think that's really true. And you know, the, what brought us to this was this very long line of work in clinical psychology and all of James Pennebaker's work showing the positive impact of of the writing. I mean, we still have a lot to do in terms of understanding mechanism, and I think Gerardo will spend some of his next years figuring that out. Um, but one thing that we do know is it's not just about getting the negativity down, which you could imagine could prime individuals right, to think about it even more, but some of it is about gaining insight into the situation, maybe thinking it's not as bad as you originally thought. And I think what that does is possibly just lead those worries to be less attention capturing in the moment. Um, I think uh, Matt Lieberman here has been looking at, at the brain. With spider -pulling. Comparing it to other conditions, kind of relabeling their study. We call it on it. So we have this like, science paper about spider phobia and doing the exact same thing where he shows less of a connection between, um, I think he shows between dorsal prefrontal and, and ventral medial prefrontal, these, these areas that we think are involved in worrying when they've done this relabeling. And so um, we, that could be one mechanism by which essentially the worries are less cognitively demanding in the moment. But that's as far as we can get right now. The motor skills that you acknowledge knees are shaking or something that does reduce it too, doesn't it? Oh no, is that true? Yeah, I think that's interesting, but I don't know. It was an excellent work in this, uh, these experiments. Uh, the other worry that we have is our level of performance in maths compared, compared to other nations, uh, as we all know. 
Um, we need to catch up with China, Taiwan, who score so well. How can we do that? How can we study their methods, bring it to our you know, experimental laboratories like in psychology education? Yeah, well, I mean, some people at UCLA are, are doing just that. Um, you know, Jen sitting behind you has done work in that area. But, um, <laughs> and, and we're learning a lot from him in terms of under, one thing that, for example, we have a, a hundred and some pilot data that suggests that um, one is a, so just as an example, Jim has done work showing that um, high performing East Asian, and correct me if I'm paraphrasing this wrong, um, high performing East Asian countries tend, the messages tend to give it, engage in more extended discourse. They talk more about wrong answers. It's, they're not as dogmatic in terms of this is right and this is wrong, and, and that leads students to understand different ways to do math. It's not just one way to think about one thing um, compared to U.S. cultures. And um, we think perhaps that high math anxious teachers might be on the extreme of the U.S. side in terms of being very dogmatic about how they teach math. And so I think we have a lot to learn from other cultures, and perhaps that will give us insight into what teachers who are lower versus high in math anxiety might be doing differently in the classroom to affect their students. Go back a moment to your um, experiment and insights about <coughs> children in the classroom as a kind of identities of teachers. And I'm wondering, do you know anything about how those students out of classroom experiences interact with their math knowledge? Because there are these data like uh, from Bridget Barron and Stanford and other places that the choices that girls make for careers and their interest in careers is often associated with the kinds of activities they have outside of school, especially the kinds of people they know outside of school and what they talk to them about. Yeah, that's really interesting. So we do actually have measures on parents' anxiety as part of this study. Um, and one thing that, and we're still analyzing this data, but one thing that the data suggests is that if you have either a parent or a teacher that's having that anxiety, you're kind of screwed. One, it doesn't have, we thought maybe, you know, the parents could counteract the teachers and that would be great, but it seems like they're both having an impact in this way. So we do think that there's definitely some impact of what's happening outside the classroom and, and how they see role models acting. We still have a lot more work to, to go in terms of understanding that, but there's no question it's not just about what's in the classroom. This is just one piece of the puzzle, but it, in, at least with respect to math, it, it seems like a very interesting one, especially since parents often think that math is like the responsibility. But I mean, Susan Levine and others have data showing that, um, you know, the, the opportunities kids get outside the classroom have big impacts in terms of their spatial knowledge and how they think about math. And so there's no question. Yeah, which but you, kind of, I guess I naively would have thought that children of mathy parents would think that math was more of a home thing and a school thing. Yeah, I don't know. That yeah. it may be true. Yeah. I'm just, I'm quoting sort of a general stereotype about um, where math is up. But it, it, it definitely may be true. And if you do have a mathy parent who's not anxious and a teacher who's not anxious, that's great. Um, but you know, if you have a mathy parent and you still have an anxious teacher, we're still showing impacts. Um, a, a comment and then a question. Forty years ago, when I was a math professor, I asked three women math professors what their fathers had done, and the answer was they were engineers. Uh, my, my question is, how do you define this low math anxiety group versus high math anxiety? Do you, you like have a scale and you take the upper third and the lower third? Yeah, so all of it's a continuous scale. Um, so for the for the adults, it's and for the for the kids, it's both continuous. So we always use a continuous measure, but when I plot things in graphs, I usually just do a median split. It looks the same if you take the upper or lower third. But we're always asking continuously to how is your level of math anxiety relate to these types of variables. So you, you take everybody and just divide it. Just for um, illustration. I want to go back to the writing intervention. Is there any follow-up? Do they just write, or do they talk about it, or is there some sort of follow-up activity? We've just done these mostly one-shot interventions where they just do the writing. But um, there's definitely, so we, this work was based on a long line of work where people had done journaling reputedly as a way to reduce um, burden on working memory or shown working memory differences. And so, um, you know, we've shown this power in the one-shot right before, but there's really lots of questions to be asked about when you do the writing, there's other work from um, co colleagues of ours at UC Irvine showing even doing it a week before has benefits for taking the GMAT or the LSAT, right? 
right? So there's other, um, there's other effects that are consistent with this, but I think there's lots of questions to be asked about um, what exactly needs to happen for it to have a benefit. And I just want to comment, I'm, a, I'm also a drama teacher, and you can shake out stage fright. It's something you teach me. <laughs> So we've heard anecdotal things about people doing it um, in middle school. Um, I don't know of any work done at the elementary school level, Gerardo, I don't know if you do. And um, you know, it's a really interesting question if you haven't mastered writing or you're not, you know, this isn't whether this would have a positive or beneficial or negative effect, we don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, one could imagine whether or not some sort of expressive drawing would have the same sort of benefit, we don't know. And then my um, second question is, I guess, um, like, how do you think the new, like, common core standards may have an effect on children's math and science? I think that's a really interesting question. So the question was about with the um, instantiation of the common core, how that would relate to kids' math anxiety and math achievement. And one place where I see the effect of the common core is if the teachers aren't getting prepared to teach it, right? And so now they're tasked with teaching new things or ways they haven't taught before, and if they're anxious about their math ability, I think this could potentially have a deleterious effect in this way. So I don't know, that's all I can say about it, but um, I think it's an issue that we need to make sure that we're preparing our teachers to be in the classroom and giving them the tools, not only in terms of the knowledge, but in terms of how they actually <coughs> teach it that in a way that will be um, beneficial for our students, especially when teachers are higher in math anxiety. So. As far as conveying that math is fun, does uh, Sesame Street have anything? I don't know, Susan, do you know if the Sesame Street have an effect? We caught you. Uh, well, I, I, I visited with Sesame Street. I mean, I think a lot of the, uh, if you look at their math videos, they're wonderful. I think that they can have a much more positive effect if the parents watching, you know, the program with the kid and, and discussing it rather than, you know, putting the kid in front of the television. I mean, on that note, I gave this little talk in Jim's lab the other day, and there was a guy there who Jim knows better than me. He says he's writing a song about what I was talking about, spatial language, you know, to up that for kids. And, uh, you know, I think that all the media kinds of things, including, you know, we now have to think about all the iPad and other kinds of technologies that kids can interact with and what kinds of, you know, positive or not so positive effects they can have on math learning. Yeah, Susan has really interesting work showing that parents' number talk and how much they talk about spatial things and really has a very um, beneficial impact for kids' achievement when they get to schooling. On so, girls in particular? On both. Yeah, on both. But, you could, but she also has work showing that the way parents talk about spatial things to boys and girls can differ. So parents tend to talk to boys about puzzles in terms of the shapes, angles, things that are very important for succeeding in math, and to girls they tend to talk about the colors of the puzzles. So there are things that we're probably doing un that we don't even know we're doing that might be giving different input to girls and boys about their um, that would be beneficial versus not for when they get to school in terms of math. Hi, uh, I went to the same school, kindergarten through eighth grade, and in sixth grade suddenly we had the man teaching all the math. There, there were there were like two classes every year. And uh, we had, where the teacher was teaching math. But then suddenly in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, it was sort of specialized. The man taught the math to both classes. Yeah, I mean, there's really interesting work in social psychology showing that who you have as role models can affect how women and men feel about um, a certain gender's role. So there's a great study um, showing that women tend to feel that men are more. Um, able to go into leadership roles. That's just a societal stereotype that men are more built to be leaders. And women going off to single sex colleges and co-ed institutions feel the same way at the beginning of the year. But a year later, the women at the single sex institutions think that women can be fit to be leaders as well. And it turns out it has nothing to do with being at the single sex versus co-ed institution per se, but everything to do with the amount of women that these girls were exposed to in leadership roles. And it turns out that you're more likely to have female faculty and female, strong female leadership roles at all at single sex institutions and that was the driver of this effect. So who you saw 
on these leadership roles was really predictive for whether you as a woman thought that women could be leaders. Thank you. Both the receiver and the transmitter, the eighth grader teaching the sixth one to suggestion by the social by leader. Yeah, that's an interesting question. We haven't, I mean, so the work we've done with first graders that may be a little harder to achieve, but it could be really an interesting thing to look at. We haven't looked at it well, at we all. We tried it, but I don't have any research. Many, many years ago at UCLA, we had a peer teaching room in a class on problem solving, which protected students from all fields, and some of them had mad problems. They would come to the peer room to get help, not to the class, but to the math class. And I saw two things, that the teacher and the learner both went to the class. Yeah, that's, that's really, that's, yeah, that's really, especially if you as a learner are seeing people who are teachers who are like you, that can be really beneficial. It's worth exploring. Yeah, I think it's Okay, I'm being told this is the last question. Well, <laughs> um, this is, I would think that it would be possible, for example, to uh, affect the, the testing that you're doing by uh, artificially um, inducing a greater amount of anxiety on purpose. In other words, if, if when someone, if you're giving a test to someone, if you threw a particularly hard question in the second question, doesn't that skew the test? Yeah, it's definitely um, possible. So the, in terms of the, the test the kids took, it's, um, it gets increasingly more difficult and they've done it. It's, na it's nationally more difficult, but they've taken a lot of care, I think, in terms of how they order the problems. But um, we, in our laboratory, and lots of work I haven't told you, we, we put people in situations designed to enhance that anxiety so we can see what happens when they feel anxious in a particular situation. And getting, encountering a hard problem or getting lots of feedback that you're failing relative to other people, people can do things to induce anxiety in the moment. Um, for sure, and we show lots of the same effects in terms of how it plays out and how people perform. Um, even when we just take people's professed anxiety, math anxiety in general in, in these more um, classroom-oriented situations. But we started, most of this work where we, I was looking at this phenomenon that I titled my book of, of choking under pressure. Mm -hmm. We started where we brought people in who on pre-test would score equally similar in math and might profess not to be anxious at all. We had pre-situations where we ratcheted up the stress so we could see how it affected them when we were controlling for their level of math knowledge in general. It's messier to do this sort of work because you've got math anxiety and math knowledge are comorbid, and so you have to sort of tease them out. They're not one-on-one -on -one related, but you tease them out. And so in the laboratory, we got a lot of ideas about what we were looking for in these more real-world classroom environments to get at these issues more specifically. So thanks, yeah.